Indian diaspora is integral to India. Why we are discussing at the first place Indian diaspora? When we are celebrating 75 years of Indian independence, Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav. The reason is that Indian diaspora was very much close, linked with India before independence, worked for independence in a very significant way, which is still not captured adequately as it should have been done. And in post independent India also in last three decades, it had played a very significant role about which we need not just to research and study, but to celebrate the role has been so remarkable. And it is for this region, I think it's in the fitness of the thing that it's good to discuss and celebrate Indian diaspora when we are celebrating 75 years of India's independence. I've been given 35 minutes, so I'll be brief and touching a few points um, just to flag some of them. The first important thing which we must understand that Indian diaspora, when we discuss its association before independence or post independence is not a monolithic community. It is a very diverse community and their role, their responses, our attachment with them, their contribution is therefore very diverse. In fact, Indian diaspora globally is a microcosm of Indian diversity. So as many diversity you find among Indians, so many diversity you will find among Indian diaspora. To cut the classification and discussion short, we have two kinds of Indian diaspora at broader level that we must distinguish when we would like to discuss their attachment or connect with them, their role in the past, their role at, in present India. is One is the PIO, people of Indian origin, who have migrated from India and have acquired the citizenship of other countries. The second one is those who are a migrant community, stay there for a very long time, maybe lifelong, but they still hold Indian passport. And they are called NRI, non-resident Indians. And side by side with these two, when we discuss Indian diaspora, there is two other categories that also we should remember, uh, which cut across these two categories. One is the old diaspora, those who went before in Indian independence, and the new diaspora, those who went after Indian independence. The old diaspora, some of them are very old. They might have lost touch with India, those who went during medieval time, ancient time, as preachers, as traders. But those who went during colonial times, 200 or, or, or 300 years ago, many of them have retained some kind of image or some kind of connect with India, which is what matters for our discussion today. Therefore, this, this old diaspora is something which is very sizable in, in, in number and which still matters for India in terms of our understanding diaspora connect. The new diaspora, again, is diversified. We, you have a high-tech digital diaspora which went to develop country. So either they were super skilled, a skilled doctor, engineer, um, of course, computer scientist, or, and they are certainly mostly in developed countries. Then there are a good number of low-skilled diaspora, and that number is quite high, around 6 million plus which are largely in Gulf countries, in Africa and some Southeast Asian countries where they are very low skilled and they have very little chances of settling down and becoming um, citizen of those countries. So when we 
try to understand India connects with the diaspora before and after independence, their role um, associated with India. We must keep these different categories of diaspora in mind, then probably we'll be able to understand their contribution. So the diaspora is important, therefore, the, all these categories for celebrating 75 years of India's independence because they played into different capacity in different places a role in independence of India to which I'll come. And then also they are playing very significant role in post-independent India, which we are now getting to know and trying to increase their role by providing more space within India through policy changes, through policy options given to them. What is equally important for us to understand the role of Indian diaspora in independence is two things. One, that one aspect of diaspora that they went in a very difficult situation where they went to replace during colonial period in large number, which forms the part of Indian diaspora policy now, as a whole diaspora, they went to replace slavery. And despite the fact that they went as indentured worker, they were treated more or less like slaves. So the condition le legally was different. And therefore their capacity to contribute in terms of India's independence was limited wherever they were situated. But at the same time, there were quite a good number of Indians who had gone to Southeast Asia as merchant, as, as migrant, uh, to seek better life, and also in developed countries like United Kingdom, United States, Canada, where they were well settled and they were in a position to play important role. So if one wants to understand that, that is something that one needs to capture in a separate presentation, but just in nutshell, if you want to understand their role, the role of INA and role of Subhash Chandra Bosch in mobilizing resources, not just the financial, but the human, and hardcore committed cadre of people who are willing to lay their life for India's independence is phenomenal. It's, it's the massive mobilization in Southeast Asia by Subhash Chandra Bose in reaching to volunteers to create an army to fight for India independence, who really fought for India and came up to Northeast of India fighting through um, Myanmar at that point of time. And so that is something we must celebrate and we must pay our tribute when we celebrate 75 years of our independence. Second is the movement in developed countries where you can find in India House in the UK, where Sam Jim Burma and many others, activists who mobilize support in different ways. I don't want to go into details of that to, to get support for India's independence and who gave their life working for that, though they could not see independent India. Um, similarly, Gadda movement that was not just present in UK, but in USA, in Canada, everywhere you have support, which work tremendously for India's independence. And they, they mobilized local support, they mobilized financial support, they worked with their government, they worked with the civil community over there to seek support for India's independence. So they pay, played their role in a very, very significant way, which we need to celebrate when we remember our 75 years of independence and we, we must pay tribute and acknowledge their contribution when they contributed so significantly with India. Let us look at the contrast of this, that their contribution, their role to our India independence 
was how much limited barred by the Indian leaders, a section of Indian leaders who were not for any attachment, any acknowledgement, any support, any connect and any link with Indian diaspora before independence. Not to say that all Indian leaders were for dissociation with them, but the leaders who matters and who mattered most, organization which mattered, which politically mattered most, like Indian National Congress, was for dissociation with Indian diaspora. Nehru, since 1930, when he became prime minister, uh, when he became uh, in charge of I uh, Indian National Congress foreign policy cell, he wrote a policy of India, which was still under col colonial rule. What INC should have its policy to us? Different countries, different regions, different issues, including Indian diaspora. And there he takes a categorical policy that India must actively dissociate with Indian diaspora. That they went as hireling of exploiter and they must not be part of India's policy. That they must prove themselves, make their place wherever they went and we have nothing to do with them. They are for us a foreign citizens. They must act, behave, and be a foreign citizen where they are located and work for their country, must not look towards India. India has nothing to offer them. And it was Nehru, but there was Srinivas, Sastri, Kunjru, K. Munsi, within Congress itself, who were totally opposed to this, any Besant also. They wanted to connect with Indians who had gone as indentured worker, as free passenger, as Kangani workers, and under deceptions and the lure, and they were being treated as slave, and they must be part of India's policy to get a legitimate place and treatment in their society. But they were minority, they were a voice which didn't finally matter. It's the Nehru who, who prevailed. The exception was South Africa, where India. Indian National Congress and Nehru remained committed to what Gandhi had done over there before he came to India in 1915. And they made South Africa an exception where they were for all kinds of support and association to Indian people in South Africa. But for all other countries, the Nehru prevailed effectively for Indian National Congress to dissociate with them. And therefore, when you see their contribution to Indian National Congress policy of dissociation and their contribution for India's independence, you must compare and contrast that they did contribute even when India was playing out a policy of active dissociation under the Indian National Congress and Nehru. Post-independence also, Nehru as a prime minister, also largely deciding the foreign policy, was opposed to any association with diaspora. And when India became independent, diaspora looked towards India with a lot of hopes, aspiration that India will support them. India will articulate their cause because in most of the country, barring a few they were in a minority position. They were being given rough treatment. They were getting marginalized. Even if they were doing economically and educationally better over the years, politically and socially, they are still being marginalized. And therefore, they look towards India to provide some kind of backup and support. But Nehru said no. We will have a policy of active dissociation till he was alive. Except in 1962, when India was attacked by China, and Nehru had no support coming from his socialist friend Russia, 
And of course, the capitalist West was not someone whom he can easily appeal because he had been dissociating with them and leaning towards socialist country, China, Hindi, Chini, Wai, Wai, and Russian socialists. And therefore, the only hope he could see was towards Indian people across the world whom he had dissociated and said, first time changing his statement, earlier statement, that Indian diaspora has a dual loyalty. Look at the contrast that the statement makes, that it should help the country of origin when it is in crisis. And they must support India when it is being attacked and when it is under crisis. And this was appeal in a desperation. But despite his policy from 1930 to 1962 of policy of active dissociation with Indian diaspora, the diaspora globally queue up before Indian embassy for days to contribute money, ornaments, any other thing that they have to contribute, which can be carried to India to support India. So that demonstrated the support, the feeling, the attachment, the connect the Indian diaspora has with India, despite having a leadership which was insensitive to these connects and followed a active dissociation policy which completely indoctrinated the bureaucracy, the embassy, the leaders, the debates, the academics, all over. That made them feel the diaspora is just a foreigner. We have nothing to look at them. In contrast to this, before I come to the current connect of Indian diaspora with India, there was simultaneously, as I said, a group within Congress Annie Bashan, Sinewa Sastri, Kunjuru, uh, K. Munsi, who wanted to connect with diaspora, but they were marginalized. Other than Congress, it was RSS from very beginning that wanted to connect people, we connect with people of India. It's Pracharak, we are in touch with them before independence, and even after independence, when Nehru played its active policy of dissociation. They were designated, dedicated Pracharak, like Chaman Lal and others who contributed significantly to connect with diaspora globally. RSS and later on Jansen and much later BJP had always treated Indian people of in Indian or people of Indian origin as part of its policy objective, to connect with them, to link with them, to appreciate and support the Indian civilizational cultural heritage that they have preserved much more safely than what many other communities, including in India, we have done, with much more respect than what we do, and to link with them. And therefore, when BJP came, under Janta government, um, for a very short period of time under Bajpayee, that was played out, but it was a very short experiment, a limited capacity to experiment. But the message was clear that they, the diaspora policy of India is going to change when time comes to change it, when party comes in power, which can change it. And then, therefore, when it was being planned, a crisis came in 1990s when India was going to get bankrupt in 1990s. Uh, we were not having even two billion US dollars to pay for our Im import bill. Any day we are going to get bankrupt. That is in this situation, the Congress government, which despite Nehru's appeal of 1962 till 1991, had maintained because of indoctrination of active dissociation policy towards diaspora. The bureaucracy was indoctrinated, the academics were indoctrinated, the public opinion, the press, as if you would talk about Indian diaspora, you are talking of something, you know, totally unacceptable. They decided also to appeal to diaspora to help them out 
from the economic crisis by depositing their money in the State Bank of India branches in their countries. And diaspora naturally said, hello, who are you? Where is India? How are we connected? Do we know each other? And this was a reply which was expected. And diaspora didn't respond much, despite the fact that it, it didn't want India to go down the drain of being declared a bankrupt country, a country which was supposed to emerge as important international player was going to get bankrupt, with which they are associated, was something that they, they were not willing to support. And when Kong, when BJP government came to power under Atal Bihari Bajpayee, they surfaced globally to reach out to the government. Government surfaced to come out and change the policy completely by taking a U-turn where it said the Indian diaspora connect is on. Active dissociation is out. Proactive association is in and under L.M. Singhvi, the five-member committee, high-level committee was appointed to visit a large number of diaspora countries where you have diaspora concentration, number is large, to find out what they want from India. What can India them to connect with India? What can India do to support them? What can they do to, to support India in what is its priority? And the committee mapped the diaspora expectation map their strength, map the, uh, the demand that they have, and therefore came out with a policy which Atal Bihari Vajpayee government implemented, where large number of policy instruments were introduced. You, you might have heard about PIO card, you might have heard about uh, Pravasi Bharatiya Divas, three days of celebration of diaspora with the prime minister, president, all cabinet ministers, state chief ministers, inviting the diaspora leaders and discussing with them uh, how can how to connect better awarding them these people whom we wanted to dissociate by bharat samman which is one of the highest one giving regularly every year to do mini pravasi bharatiya divas in important diaspora country to invite children to visit india or no india program to provide fellowship to diaspora children to make diaspora children the same fee as Indian students pay, to put on the uh, airport all the board welcome uh, for NRI, PIO. So several instrument policies um, were launched. All Indian high commissions were then instructed that to change the policy of dissociation, to go and connect with diaspora, because diaspora is a policy that government of India is now going to follow proactively. It is going to reverse this one. The diaspora connect started that we started giving result. Diaspora also played its role, made its contribution when India needed just two billion US dollar. When it placed two plane loads of gold, left it from Reserve Bank of India to Bank of England just for two billion to give bank guarantee against import bill, diaspora on request of India. When India launched India resurgent bond, it bought bond for long term for 6 billion US dollar, which were parked in the State Bank of India branches. And therefore, the entire uh, problem of foreign exchange disappeared overnight when we had that. Similarly, they played very many roles which, which there's no time to elaborate all of them but some of them like india us nuclear deal could not have come if the diaspora had not played a very significant role and allowed india to to huge nuclear technology despite not, not signing nuclear non-proliferation treaty and similarly when Mo, uh, prime minister modi came to power he launched the diaspora policy with a new vigor. Wherever he went outside India, the most important program besides the government to government interaction was the diaspora connect. His visit was never complete until unless there is a program with diaspora in that country 
And in most countries, the Diaspora Connect program went very successfully in conveying India's message that those years of disconnect is over. Now it's time to connect with India, and India welcomes you, India recognizes you, India celebrates you. And therefore, when we celebrate this 30, 75 years of India's independence, it's part of celebration of our connect, of our resolve to work together. Of course, this had been uh, affected by some other global changes as well. As we know, the globalization has ignited many changes. Countries after countries are reaching out to their diaspora. In China, in 1980, 64% of their foreign direct investment used to come to China through their diaspora. Not all of them owned by diaspora, but used to come through their diaspora. The country like Poland, country like Italy has a third chamber of parliament exclusively for people who had migrated hundreds of years ago. A third chamber of parliament to celebrate them. So world is celebrating diaspora, had been celebrating diaspora since long. Israel, of course, is an exceptional, phenomenal case where diaspora role for their country and the country engagement with diaspora globally is unparalleled. But that might be an exception for various regions. But Indian engagement with diaspora in three decades is seen across the world as one of the best engagement where 30 million diaspora, which is 30 million plus diaspora, which is present outside, brings 83 billion plus remittance every year, which is far more than the GDP of many countries in the world. And this diaspora connect in, in two and a half decades has been so successful that we now need to rise as a global community, as a global player around the world, in knowledge economy, as we had been in the past, Vishnu Guru, and we are now riding the wave of knowledge economy, which is again based on education. We must celebrate this by linking with Indian diaspora as our strategic asset, as the one who are our heritage resource. And India is global only with connect with Indian global diaspora. Thank you so much for this time.